I'm Gab, he's Jules, blue skies over West London, blue are still over North London, we'll get to that in a minute, but Jules, uh, so much going on, oh, all yeah. the leagues are back, Bayern, huge win for them, yeah. Chelsea leave it late, Liverpool lose, uh, Real Madrid throw up a stinker, Barcelona are impressive, yeah. I, Napoli and Conte, boom, top of the league, how about that? All right, so much to get into, but of course we have to start the North London Derby, because they tell me this game is quite important, <laughs> I will tell you. As a neutral, I'm watching on television, and I know like we're always so far behind the trend, right? In in the way mainstream media talks about these people, right? So people talk about Pep Tiki Taka, as we've seen, like that's way way passe. Uh, in fact, we saw we've seen direct Pep very much so this weekend. Yeah. Um, but also Arsenal, and they had plenty of reasons to do so. Effectively, four midfield options out in mm -hmm. uh, maybe even five or four, I guess. Uh, for serious ones, right? And so they hunker down and they say, okay, Spurs, let's see this Ange ball and we'll nick something on a set piece or maybe turned out to be a set piece. Yeah. Um, and they, 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 they said, well, we have no fear of being physical. Um, is this a sign of maturity or do you think Arteta would have played differently if he'd had everybody? No, I think he would have played differently if he had had Rice and Odegaard especially. They only had 14 first-team players in that squad. The bench was full of teenagers that nobody had ever heard of, including one whose first name is Maldini, which I thought that was pretty, yeah, I'm pretty wondering, spectacular. I, some of these names sounded like regens. Like, I, like the only guy on the bench I'd heard of with the kid was, when, was Ethan uh, one one area, area, because everybody's yeah. talked about him. But like, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was, I think it was a difficult week to prepare for this huge game. And, and yeah, I think they would have played differently. But this, after first 15 minutes where they were a little bit sloppy and obviously considered the Kuluzewski chance, uh, the two Kuluzewski chance, and then the moment really where the game could have turned on that Solanke, uh, Solanke chance or half chance when, they, when Spurs recovered the ball really high, it's a mistake by White. I'm not sure what Solanke is doing and Saliba managed to kind of kick the ball away and clear the ball. Um, after that, Arsenal were in complete control without having the ball. Spurs had the love of the ball and, and Ange said after the game, we control the game because they had more of the ball. It's not just because you have the ball that you're controlling the game, really, no, you if you ask. don't do anything with it. And, and Spurs really struggled to break this incredible Arsenal defence. I think we need to give credit to Arsenal defence because they are the best defence in the league and they are, I know in numbers, Liverpool are still there, but overall, I think this Arsenal defence is maybe even the best in Europe. They are so, so good, so well drilled. And if you don't have something a bit special to break them down, like Spurs right. didn't really on Sunday, you struggle. I'm going to be Mr. Contrarian, put on my Spurs hat here for a minute. I thought there were two big calls in the game, both of which, and we can debate, but both of which went Arsenal's way. Uh, certainly the timber on, on Porro, um, which some people felt could have, been, could, have, could have gone to a red. That definitely not. All right, you're hundred percent of that. It's it's the side of his foot that touches Porro's ankle. So he rolls on the ball and then the side of his foot hits Porro's ankle. There's no there's right. no studs on Porro's ankle, there's there's nothing. It's not with the sole, it's just with the side of his boot. Was it? Are yeah. you sure about that? Yeah. Okay. All right, all right, all right. And, and then and the then second the, one? and then afterwards he runs into he runs into Vicario rather than showing him his respect and getting out of those out of the way. That's fine. That's that's, that's not a yellow, whatever, right? Yeah, that's it, fine. Well what in the same incident when Vicario confronts him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he, he runs so, away like a little girl, right? And then you know So he said, Yeah, that's a yellow. That was, so so that's what he got the yellow two for. Yellows. You wanted the yellow for Vicario? I've seen yellow some for people. Look, I don't. I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. uh, but there are some people that have argued that. I, I think. I think probably. Maybe the vibe probably was it was correct. Australian, what I have more Australian of a problem. Australian referee and maybe they want to advantage the Australian coach. I don't know. Yeah. But by the way, I've seen people. I've seen Arsenal a, fans. I've seen one. Weird. It was just to be weird. One yeah, famous. What, what's weird to have an Australian referee no, with no, an Australian coach? Well, it's just. It's just. I, you know, I think I, you can't question the integrity of Jared Gilles, who was really good, I think, I, in the game overall. Sorry. It's just there's, there's one Australian coach, one Australian referee, and in the big okay. game, the biggest game of the season for the Australian coach, they could have picked another referee, maybe, to avoid you, people doing what you okay, said. Okay, first of all, saw. I've seen some Arsenal fans do this, yeah, including yeah. one former colleague of ours. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's yeah. completely ridiculous. We have French referees with French coaches in the Champions League all the freaking time. Okay, let's grow up. We literally have English referees with English coaches every day of the week. I mean, seriously? We yeah. want to make a big deal out of this? No, no, For no. For shame. Nobody did. Nobody did. I, I hope nobody in the game who can actually be 
taken care of. All right, Jules, we're going to get into this more on the Gab and Jules podcast, but just to kind of foreshadow, I think two hands to the back. I'm not saying uh, from Gabriel when he scored when he when, when he scored the goal. Two hands on Romero's back. If Romero goes down, and there's a different referee, um, I think he's at serious risk of having that goal disallowed. Now, uh, Romero's defending is so terrible there. Yeah, yeah. But I think that could have been disallowed. We, we've seen situations like that disallowed. But we're going to break this down further. I chose, you looked at me like I was insane. Two hands to the back. Look, I, again, I'm not making excuses for Romero because he, you, you literally, you're supposed to be the defensive leader, the best defender you're, you're facing, I'm guessing. And we can debate whether Gabriel's better in the air as an attacking threat than Havertz. I think it's, it's close, but yeah. you know, Gabriel's scored by a ton of goals, right? So your job is to, is to mark him. In that structure, it's a hybrid defensive system that they have, but yeah. you are the one-on-one with Gabriel. You, one thing that you don't do is turn your back to him as the ball goes in, right? Now that said, we clearly see two hands to his back. And whether you're using the hands for leverage or whatever, it's not a great thing to do. There are some referees that will call a foul straight away for that. I don't think anymore. I think it's a very minimal push. I, I can't remember. You said we, we've seen it. We've seen those kind of goals. It's a minimal push. Before. But if he collapses. I don't think so. He can't collapse, Gabby. He, why not? Because it's not hard, it's, the push is not hard enough for him to go down. That's why he's not but going could, down. But he could use the whole usual excuse. Oh, but it unbalanced me. I was jumping, whatever. He was not jumping, though. It was, it was, there was just a contact in the box. Like, there's contacts all the time on set pieces. There aren't many con- It's I, All I'm saying is, in the age of VAR, two hands to the back. I don't think so. He's not. Like, Otherwise, hand check him with one hand. But then, but then VAR would have called it and they would have cancelled it. Yeah, because VAR gets no, everything no, no, no. right I, all I, the time. I could not disagree more with you. Right. We saw at Newcastle last season where Arsenal felt really aggrieved on Gabriel on that goal and that was not given either and that was very different to what we saw yesterday where it's just we there was one in the first half timber on brennan johnson in the far post on a on a corner for on a cross i think from madison and it's the same timber is kind of holding on to brennan johnson this is not enough to give a penalty like it's not enough for the lead, it's not even a push for the the two hands on Gabriel on the back of Romero to cancel that goal. I think. I think holding is slightly different, and like personally, it's I think exactly the same. Then you no, prevent the player from doing it's, anything. It's not exactly the same, and I'll, I'll, and I'll tell you why. Right. Right? A lot of times with holding, there is reciprocal holding. There's there's two people who are who are holding each other, right? Um, personally, I think a lot more of that should be sanctioned with VAR. Right? And, and I think it should give more penalties for that. It's also right? a contact. It's just but, a contact sport too. Still, okay. contact so. does not mean hold, right? Yeah. But and you, you, you put your body in front of somebody, you can't move. This is it. You're not going to give a penalty for that. In the same way that when you're defending on someone on a corner, you can't just you know. There's you, a difference. You between, touch each other all the time. There's a difference between standing there. Holding means you are grabbing their shirt or you're hooking their arms, right? That's a yeah. completely different, that's a complete, I, I personally think they could be even tougher on that. I don't, I don't think there's any kind of basis of the sport. It's got nothing to do with the contact sport. The push, I think obviously you have to be smart about. All I'm saying is you're putting yourself at risk and Arsenal not going into the Champions League and in those games, you have to be mindful of that. You know, you could have, you can have the same effect to create distance. He's a big, strong boy. Maybe with one hand, so it looks more like a hand check or whatever. And some defenders are very good at making it seem as if it was a lot harder push. It's actually difficult, I think, to judge a push on video. So that, that is all I'm saying. Beyond that, I think the way Spurs played, while they did have their chances early, getting back to the game, I agree with you. There is so much sterile possession. And look, mm. Arsenal, you know, they, they, they put on their hard hats and they defended. I, I, Martinelli hasn't always impressed me in the past off the ball. I thought he did a lot of defensive work, which I wasn't expecting. Saka also, but we expected that. Yeah. Um, and so, I look, I'm not saying it's easy to break people down, but you expect something more than James Madison and a line of six guys spread right to left, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's what, I th- that's what I thought was disappointing. And we've said it before, this is nothing new on Spurs' limitations, really. <clears throat> Set pieces, it happens time and time again. Postecoglou doesn't want a set piece coach. He, for me, he's not sorting out any of the issues from Vicario to the man, to the marking to the organization as a whole. 
in defensive set pieces. So this will keep happening this season. And with the ball, you can't just... So the plan A, I understand, is to put a lot of, commit a lot of bodies forward and a lot of chaos and press high and intensity. Okay, but if that doesn't work, what else do you have? All they did for the last half hour after the Gabriel goal was crossing the ball in the box where you often only had Solanke on his own, maybe somebody else with him against Gabriel and Saliba, who are probably the two best defenders to defend crosses. Yeah, if, It made no sense whatsoever. And I think even if you had other people in there, again, Solanke, big, strong boy, but you don't have too many other, unless you bring up one of the center backs, which I guess is why Romero wandered up at the end. Um, you know, it's not like Son is a major aerial threat. It's not like Brendan Johnson yeah, is a yeah, major. Right, yeah. You know, Kulusevsky's tall, but he's not a tremendous header of the ball either. That's the part, you know, maybe Richarlison might have done something. I did wonder why, instead of those crosses and shots from distance, if you have all those people forward, maybe the thing is take, take more people on, right? Kulusevsky can dribble. If you've got your players back, you're not scared of the uh, you're not that scared of the counterattack. See if you can draw a foul. See if you can beat a man and then deliver a, a cross. Once mm. you have that, you know, you, once you have the the the, the, the defense uh, destabilized because you've created an overload, right? I'm not saying these are great, but since you don't have the patterns of play, and that is one of the big differences, for example, with City, who you know, if you want, a few years ago used to commit a ton of people, and they still do sometimes, commit a ton of people forward, you have the one-twos you to, the, to, to set up the cutback and, and whatnot. How many of those crosses were cutbacks? None. No, no. One, two. I mean, because you know. they just have a plan A. So there's just no plan B. There's nothing else for them to offer. I don't think they work on anything else. So your two fullbacks come inside all the time. There are hardly no overlaps for fullbacks, which I think would do something different. And then we ask questions to the opposition and the way they've been defended because there's a point where, okay, the first 10, 15 minutes were okay, were good. After that, it was so easy for Arsenal to work out what Spurs would do. Poro used to do always the same. Udoji on the other side, always the same. Solanke and Kulisevsky in the centre, would oh, Madison, so it was just so predictable. The whole thing from Spurs after the first 15 minutes was just so predictable. There was just no movement into the half space or not enough, certainly not on the left, a little bit on the right. What was Son doing? And what was Son's position for the last half hour? What was Ange thinking when he, he made those changes? Sa, Odober, Timo Werner, apart from just, well, you know what? Who do I have on the bench who can attack? Okay, let's chuck them in. Well, Son was completely locked. You have your best player is one of the best players in Europe, and then you give him almost no position for 30 minutes in a game like this. This is I was just so disappointed by Postecoglou. I think Andrew would say that he puts a lot of faith in the players and in their instincts. And yeah, you know, and no, Werner are on not, because they're good at running at opponents, right? Doing exact taking them on. No, Which Odebert did a little bit, Werner hardly did because he didn't have any space, right? You don't play a game like this with instinct. You have to give your players some guidance, a structure. This is not this is not five aside on a Tuesday night uh, like I play. This this is this is a serious stuff. You can't just not tell your players where they play. And Son was completely lost in the last half hour. It just didn't make any sense. I just don't understand. Um I think he's threading a fine needle, but I agree with you. This feels really one-dimensional. And it's it's not just at the field. Look, they could have scored. I don't think it would have been the Kulusevsky chance early. There were other they, they had they had chances in the yeah, course yeah. of the game, right? But it feels like the opposite of what you were describing when what what he described as controlling the game. It felt like they were not controlling the game. It felt like they were seeing what stuck. And we can often get that impression when the other team just sits and which is what Arsenal did for, for yeah, a lot yeah. of the game, right? But equally, you expect a twist. You expect something other than just, let me wait for this talented player to do something special. Because yes, Kulusevsky can do it, Madison can do yeah, it, yeah. Brandon Johnson's fast, whatever, Son can certainly do it. But you can't just rely on it happening out of the blue. No, it, no. You create conditions for it yeah, to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the control thing, I think, is a really interesting point because... Arteta would say that they control the game too because they had Spurs in front of them. They were deep like they wanted. They were very well drilled and well organized, as we've been saying. So a team can have 70% of the ball and that doesn't mean you control the game. Yeah, you have the ball, so in a way you control the ball. But if you do nothing with it, the team that is defending 
also is controlling the game. So there's control out of position as well. Out, out of possession, sorry. So it's, it was just quite interesting to see Ange saying, you know, we played in the half, we had the ball, we had control. And in the end, Arsenal and, and Arteta and the players, certainly the ones I saw after the game, felt like we had them exactly where we it, wanted. They didn't create anything. We controlled the game the way we wanted, even without the ball. So this is the classic thing uh, to, to, to sort of broaden this out. There are some teams and some players who enjoy not having the ball. Some defenders who are, who are very comfortable saying like, here, you have all this possession. I'm going to limit your chances. And obviously, and this was a difference you know, when, you, when you talk about Juventus, Juventus in their heyday yeah. when Bonucci and Barzagli and that Chiellini fella were at their best, they'd be happy to let you have the ball and play in their half knowing that you were never going to get off a good chance, right? Yeah. They were very comfortable with that. Other teams... When they're like that, other teams want to play in the other half because, you know, like, oh, you're in our half, something could happen. They get a little bit nervous, a little bit frantic. I think Gabriel and Saliba are coming to that point where they are that comfortable. This back four, yeah. as a group, is getting there. I would say more the two center backs, especially Gabriel, who I think has improved yeah, yeah. a lot in that sense, you know, more so than, you know, Timber's only had a couple games. But... That is another big step forward. And remember, also happening without the Declan Rice in front of them too, yeah. which is, you know, final word. Um, shout out to my boy Georgie. Yeah, all, all the haters. He's too weak. He's too weak. The man hasn't played since the middle of June. Yeah. Steps into starting lineup for North London derby, and does his thing. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It was considering all the players missing. I thought it was a really good performance from Arsenal all overall. And Georgie, and Georgie. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, enough North London Derby. How about some quick hits instead? Let's go, Gab. Liverpool fall at home to Nottingham Forest 1 0. Jules, slot, they need to be, slot says they need to be better in possession. Kind of what Ange did not say. Yeah, yeah I mean, against the well organized Forest defense and the low block, they just never really found, I think, their way. Okay, Luis Diaz hit the post, but he made that chance himself by the way he recovered the ball and everything. Apart from that, it was pretty flat from Salah and Jota and Soboslai, Diaz, where they just never found a solution. And to be fair, I first, first defeat at home against Forest since 1969, so a very long time, 55 years. And Forest could have scored too easily after their, that, that great Otson Odoi yeah. score. I think credit to Forest and for, for Liverpool. You know, I think sometimes it's hard and we've seen it, for example, with the Juventus. We saw it with a few clubs this weekend as well. So, some had no problems, but I think on the back of an international break, we often say that it can be a little bit difficult because you haven't had your players for two weeks. They're coming back. It could be a little bit flat, a little bit sloppy. And I think that's what happened to Liverpool. Maybe yeah. Scott should have changed something in the starting lineup. Uh, yeah, and I think he will change something in midweek in, 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 in the Champions League. Murillo, by the way, I thought was phenomenal. Yeah, again, again yeah. just as he's been for much of last season. Um, but I think we have to, you know, I don't like Nuno Espirito Santo. <laughs> I don't like Anthony Alanga. But his pass for yeah, the... for the great pass. Uh, they were really, really yeah, good. Yeah. And you have to give them credit for yeah, that. Yeah. Nuno's um, coaching worked really well. But uh, there is stuff for a slot to work on, especially against Park Buses. Klopp had this issue before. Remember, that's why he brought in Thiago Alcantara. Yeah. Ryan Gravenberch and Alexis McAllister aren't... They... they they're not Thiago Alcantara. No, definitely not. Barcelona roll on to a 4-1 win at Girona in the derby. And Lamine Yamal backs two goals. Gab, they've got key players out. And they're still running away with La Liga. Yeah, it's early, but they are doing it. It's amazing the number of guys that are out. Again, I want to talk about Lamine Yamal because you can look at the two goals. right? So, so this game opens up, and it is a little bit back and forth in the first half, right? And then, okay, you can say one of the goals was, was a gift from the goalkeeper. Um, yeah. on the first one and the second one he shoots in a crowded he pokes it through a bunch of people that's fine but he did that not some other dude he did that he seized the game that way and then Barcelona just grew better it's easier of course to play 2-0 uh, up um, the, I, I thought the Lewandowski chance where he did not score was phenomenal yeah. um, the Dani Olmo goal was a moment and then the, the Casado the, 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 the I'm Mark not Mar sure if it's for Pedri though Oh, I want to on. believe it's for him. I want to believe. He's supposed to be the bad Mark. Yeah, like, yeah Come yeah. on, man. Like, no. Uh, very, very impressed. I want to, I'm so curious to see what happens when, uh, when the A-team returns. How Flick fits these people together. Yeah. Oh, and Ferran Torres. That was stupid. Yeah, that was nice. really, really dumb. Bayern beat up Holstein Kiel 6-1 and Harry Kane scores a hat-trick. 
Jules, is this company getting it right or are Kiel just awful? No, Kiel was just just not good enough for this Bayern team uh, who scored early as well and they were just never a match. I mean, the, 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 the difference in level if you're watching that game was just so striking. There was no there was no match. I'm well done for Kane to Kane for a hat trick and a and, and one assist, I think, Michael Lise with his first goal, which I think would be really good for him. Even Kingsley Coman had an assist. So it was a great, great afternoon on Saturday uh, for Bayern and for company, I guess. These this are always good, especially before the Champions League. Antonio Conte and Napoli at top of the table in Serie A after winning 4-0 away to Cagliari. Gab, you were sceptical. Is he proving you wrong or we should not get too carried away yet? No, we should not get carried away because this isn't the team he wants, right? His newcomers, uh, McTominay and Gilmore, they came on. Uh, David Neres, you know, these we haven't seen these guys yeah, yet. Yeah. And as far as the flow of the game is concerned as well, right? They get, they're, they're kind of fortunate with a deflection on the opening goal. And then Cagliari just pummeled them. Alex Manet yeah. has to make some incredible saves. And then Kvara does the Kvara Dona thing, scores a goal out of nothing. And then you're 2 0, and you know, the last two goals are a defensive mistake and garbage time. So I think you have to put this in context. Obviously, Conte going to Conte. So he came out and he says, Well, you know, this is a team that's growing. In the past, they didn't like to ha- get their hands dirty, which again plays to the hard drill sergeant, you yeah. know, butt kicker, whatever. That's who you are. And he talked about why it was so important to have Lukaku and how Lukaku was unplayable and so on. Look, he did score a goal. Uh, he Glasses did fine. Kelly as well. Nice asset and a nice yeah. for Kraskelia. But again, it's all within the context of, yeah. hey, look, where's Victor Osimhen? What happened to that yeah, guy, yeah. right? Um, I'm curious to see what happens is when we see the real Conte Napoli, so the ones with the players he wanted. Rarely has he been this backed relative to club's resources in his career. Very rarely. Jules, we're not done. We got more quick hits. Yes. Manchester United win 3 0 the way to Southampton with Christian Eriksen. Who right. that? Playing in midfield. Jules, after that rocky start, I thought they looked actually really good. Well, I didn't think for the uh, first half course, hour. No. no, I said after the rocky start. That's the first oh, half that's hour. What you mean. So then first Onana half hour. saves a penalty. Yeah, then they scored two goals in five minutes. And, and, then they and after the game. that, yeah. But yeah, the second half was better. They were 2 0 up. Um, it's good to win. This is what we saw last season with Ten Hag as well, where, and even to be fair to him, to, in his first season as well, when. Even when they didn't play too well at the start of games, they found ways. They maybe ride the luck a little bit, like that terrible penalty from Archer. Um, but they, the, they find ways of, of getting things better during I, the same game. And I think, you know, if you want to get angry at the players, get angry at them for not being good enough, if you're a United fan, or blame Ten Hag. But don't question, I think, their belief in what they're doing or their professionals. Because again, this was all set to unravel, right? Two bad results in a row, yeah. and then all of a sudden you give up. You you're outplayed for the fa- first half hour. You look around. You see you see Ericsson in midfield. You give up a penalty. This is when everything should unravel, but it didn't. No, they kept going. It didn't. Yeah, it didn't. No, you're right. It didn't. That's not nothing. No, but I'm not sure how much we learned from that game. To be fair, Eric Ten Hag will tell us he learned a lot. Maybe you're right. I, I, but at least Marcus <laughs> Rashford scored. He hadn't scored for a long time. Good for him, uh, and. And I think they go into next weekend now, like you said, with a bit more of a breather after the two defeats that they had before. Real Madrid win 2 0 away at Real Sociedad. But, Gab, why is Ancelotti saying that he didn't deserve it? Because <laughs> they didn't. The Real Sociedad hit the woodwork three times. Except for an Antonio Rudiger chance um, that where Ramiro made one of the saves of the season. Yeah. There just wasn't much else. In midfield, they suffer against the press so much. It was Modric and Valverde, no matter what combination. Now, obviously, he's got, you know, Chouameni out, Bellingham out, Camavinga out. Um, even Brian Diaz, who gives them a little bit more, mm. more, more balance, he gets injured. He's going to be out a couple months now. Really bad news, yeah. I think, because now you're forced to play Rodrigo. This doesn't work as well. Yeah. Vinicius, he won both penalties. Other than that, I think he contributed almost nothing. Yeah. The midfield is under too much pressure if the forwards don't help. It's as simple as that, yeah. right? And they got to work it out. But good news, your boy Mbappe, maybe his best game in a Yeah, in a I thought trip. he was good. I thought he, I mean, I thought he tried bar, hard. Yeah, yeah, he tried. Manchester City concedes straight away against Brentford, but come back to win 2-1. As Erling Haaland makes it <laughs> nine goals in four games. Jules, he's pretty good. Yeah, sloppy start again. We've said that for, for quite a lot of teams uh, for this weekend. 22 seconds, it took Wisa to score for Brentford. Then they could have, go, could have gone two or three nil up, even that. Uh, and then 
a bit of a little bit of luck for Haaland's first goal. Let's be honest, because De with Bruyne, his right foot. No, no, no. But De Bruyne has the ball. It's a Brentford defender that puts the ball into Haaland's path. Uh, it's a good but finish. It's nice for him to finish with his right. Yeah, foot. it's really nice. It's a good finish, but the ball should have never gone to him in the first place, really. So after that, uh, same on the second goal. It's a goal they should never concede, really, at that level. From Pinock, it's unacceptable. But it's a great finish again, and Haaland could have scored a hat trick. If not four, so incredible. Pep says he's in the best form of his life, which I believe. Uh, and I just don't know where he will stop. But it's Arsenal on next weekend. Yeah. And obviously he hasn't scored last season in the three games that he played against Arsenal. So let's see how he does next weekend. I'm not a big Ederson guy, but against that sort of crazy high press from Brentford, the way all of a sudden they decided to say to, to tell him, all right. You know, you get on the ball even more than you usually do. Don't yeah. be afraid to pass it long. And his are long passes. They go all on the ground. It's not just hoofing it. Um, that just, that's another cheat code that yeah, they have. Yeah, yeah. Simple as. Yeah, definitely. And sticking with City, Gary, they're hearing over the 115 charges with the Premier League begins today. I've got a feeling that it will take a very long time, though, before. Your feeling is correct. Yeah. Um, I think lawyers are involved. It's very complicated. Um... I think that there the will be potentially, depending how it goes, it could be an appeal from either side. So, yeah, uh, this is going to be messy and it's going to be long and it's going to be boring. And I think <laughs> smart people say the new year is when this will be, will have uh, an outcome. I I'm, I don't even believe in that. Paris Saint-Germain go a goal down, but then beat up Brest 3-1. Jules, another sparkling performance from Ousmane Dembele. And I want to ask you, yeah. with Mbappe gone, is he ready to step up and fill part of his boots, half a yeah, boot? Yeah, that's the question. He's guys. the most expensive, one, you know, the second oldest, or sorry, most experienced second oldest player after yeah. Marquinhos. It's got to be him. Yeah, it's got to be him. I think people at the club hope that it's him. Uh, Luis Enrique hopes that it's him as well. I think Usman himself hopes that it's himself. Uh, four goals already this year, as many as this season, as many as in the whole of last season, for example, uh, for PSG. So this is good. He was far more efficient in this game than I've ever seen him before, even in his end product on crosses, for example, or even dribbling and, and, a, and, a, and a pass. So this is good. I, I just hope he can keep that kind of mindset for longer, especially when Barcola was a bit more disappointing, uh, but Asensio was good. Uh, and Fabian Ruiz was outstanding, I Great thought, goal. again. Great goal. Great second half from him. He just brings something different, and that's good leading into the Champions League and, and then the, uh, the few games to come. But that was a good performance from PSG. We were being lucky to get behind. Although uh, Donnarumma got injured, not, not seriously, but he will miss the game against Girona in midweek in the Champions League. Bring back Keylor Navas. I imagine. He's a free agent, We will suffer enough that right. we will see for the first time. So. Uh, yeah. Ten years, I don't think Dembele has started more than 22 games ever in a league season. Ever. In wow. ten years. Yeah, yeah. That's the other big thing. Yeah. Milan destroy Venezia 4-0 and Theo Hernandez and Rafael Leao are off the naughty step, Gab. How are they looking ahead of the Liverpool game on Tuesday night where you will be when you uh, travel? Yeah, it, hard to say because they were 4-0 up inside half an hour. Yeah. Certainly the visual, the statement of Theo coming, ripping the ball off the defender, thundering down the wing, knocking inside for Leao who, who just uncorks this little back heel straight into Theo's pass for his finish. And it was the goalkeeper then threw into his own net. Yeah, yeah. But the visual of that, the visual of Lau embracing Fonseca is important. You know, before before the game, I mean, an ultras at a banner, no more excuses. They were undeniably under pressure. This is their first victory of the season. It does give them a lift. Now, it's not normal to be 4-0 up after half an hour. So I don't know how much you can learn from this yeah. game. Um, but it's certainly better than, uh, than not winning, not taking the three points. And... Hopefully, this Theo Leal thing is over now and they can move on. A late goal from Christopher Nkunku gives Chelsea a 1-0 win at Bournemouth. Enzo Maresca called it ugly. Uh, <laughs> is he right? And what did you think of the 14 yellow cards, a new Premier League record, by yeah. uh, that inexperienced referee we call Anthony Taylor? Yeah, uh, a lot of them were for decent as well, which I guess will be something new that the PGM will have said to the referees. Let's not, let's right. be very strict on Why don't you see he's giving you yellow cards for dissent? Stop doing STFU, it. STFU, send the captain. Yeah? yeah, come on, it's obvious, right? We can't made... just blame Nico Jackson for this. No, I know, I know. Chelsea uh, committed nine fouls in this game and got eight yellow cards. So obviously not, <laughs> not for every foul because a lot of them were for decent. But in terms of ratio of fouls committed and yellow cards received, this is never seen before. Um, 
I'm glad my boy Nkunku scored. Jaden Sancho assist. I mean, it's more of a pass towards Nkunku and then there's still a lot of work to be done from Nkunku. But a bit of luck too. Late after Sanchez considered a penalty and saved the penalty for Chelsea too, which would give him a lot of confidence it, as well. It was not perfect from Mareska yeah. and Chelsea, but at least you get a win. It's the most important. All right, I'm going to chuck something at you, right? Chelsea's four most technically gifted players. Just technical ability, right? Yeah. Whatever order you want to put them in. Cole Palmer, yeah. Joe Felix, Nkunku, and uh, Sancho for yeah. me, right? Yeah, Madweke not too far, but yeah, I'll go for those four. Of those four, only one of them starts. I know. It's another weird... I'm not saying they should start, but no, 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 yeah. balance, that is another weird team-building dysfunction yeah. of this team. Yeah. It's two stress callers draw now for Juventus, Gab. Is that Thiago Mota's shock therapy wearing off? Um, I Certainly in terms of results, yeah. I, what I would point out for this game is you got a bunch of new guys, right? Coop yeah. Miners making his first start. Nico Gonzalez making his first start. Douglas Luiz making his yeah, first start. Yeah, signings, yeah. Um, that is a big part of, of your attack, right? Vlaovic not looking great. Um, so I think we have to allow for some time. But weirdly, you know they're the only team in Europe's big five leagues yet to concede a goal this season. Really? Which, which is weird, right? You're yeah. going in the opposite direction from Allegri and comes back to this. Yeah. By Leverkusen, wrong past Hoffenheim, fear one as Victor Boniface scores twice. Jules, I guess all is well after the defeat to Leipzig. And they're ready to start another streak. The Leverkusen undefeated streak stands at one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how far they can go again this season or not in the league. But certainly, I thought they looked good in that first half, especially uh, Boniface with two goals. Terrier with his first goal for the club, which I think is good for him. It's a good finish too. They look good. They have a lot of players we said they have a lot of depth I don't think they can have any excuse now for not doing well playing well and also the Champions League this week so yeah. let's see how they do in that Inter need a late equaliser from Denzel Dumfries to avoid defeat away at Monza Gab is it because Inzaghi rotated too much it's what people say he, he, Bastoni was on the bench Alanog was on the bench Dumfries obviously on the bench Barella on the bench um but guys, this is what he does. The man rotates. The man says, I have a deep squad. Yeah. I don't have a problem with playing Christian Aslani, for example, who's not good yep. in a game like this to see if he can fill in for Shalanoglu. You can't flip out about every result. Real issue with this was their finishing. The two starters, Turam and, uh, and Lautaro especially, did not have a good no, game. That's right. And you got to take it on the chin. And also recognize the fact that Monza just defended deep and they took the lead through an absolute worldy of a header yeah. from Danny Mota. And that's all it is. Lionel Messi scores twice and bags an assist as Inter Miami beat my Philadelphia Union 3-1. Jules, uh, this was his return. His performance is what impressed me most. Others, who are saddos, will probably be more impressed with the fact that his career goals total for <laughs> club and country, which is not a thing, is now at 840, suggesting he can chase down the other guy. Yeah, like, I mean, there's still 60 goals to go. So, uh, so He's long, also a couple years, years younger. younger. Yeah, still, but, but, but true. I mean, you're right. 62, I think 62 days since he last played the game. And then he comes back. Like if he'd never been injured really and never stopped playing, it's really incredible. I don't know how much he says about MLS level or the union level or into Miami's level. I, I don't know, but I only saw the highlights of this game and he just looked like, I don't know, he just looked so good again. It was just incredible to watch. So they're by far the best team in this league. They are super favorite to obviously uh, go and, and win this. It's just, I don't know. I'm, I'm amazed again, a bit like, Cristiano in Saudi, of course, I'm just amazed how at their age they can still be so, so much better than everybody they play against or they play with even. It's mad. It's mad. And talking about Cristiano, uh, he will miss Al Nasser's first game in the Asian Champions League, which I think is tonight on Monday night, as we record this, I think, or on Tuesday. Gab, I guess that gives him more time to look after his social media. And he needs it because he apparently has become, I don't know, who tracks this? The first person in the world to pass a billion followers billion. on social media. Now, obviously, it's not like a, it's a really a billion people because it's the sum of all his social networks. Yeah, so and some, I guess, will follow him on everything, right? I think you follow him on YouTube. You might also follow him on Insta. You might also follow him on on um, on what? Uh, on, Facebook. Because you can't social. You can't Gap. do Facebook as well. So. Okay, whatever. Um, maybe he does, but. Look, uh, you know, I think I'm wary of people drawing sort of d these deep philosophical explanations of our times other than the fact that the guy is really popular yeah. uh, and he makes, and he, and together with the social media team, they make content that people obviously like. care about. Yeah, That's exactly. it. 
Aston Villa come from two goals down to beat Everton 3-2 as John Duran makes everyone lose their mind. Oh, Jules! Goal. Incredible goal, Gab. It just came on as well. It was enough to see Dibu Martinez's face after the goal. It was just like in complete shock. <laughs> uh, 20, what, 30 yards out, 25 yards out on his left foot, right in the top corner. Nothing that Pickford can do. His third goal of the season, he got the winner at West Ham in the first game of the season. He got a very important goal against Leicester as well. He, he destroyed the world champions as well. Uh, yeah, with, started and played what, 80 minutes or so, or so with Colombia against Argentina and came back quite late, obviously, like a lot of the South American players. The problem with him is he's still only 20, so he's still, still very raw. You could see him the way he plays. Uh, but that kind of instinct of those finishes and those strikes and those goals, there's another one after where he chest the ball up and try to almost do like an overhead kick. So this is the way he plays. The problem is he's got Oli Watkins ahead of him and Una is never going to play with the front two. So he will, his game time will always be limited, I think. And I don't know how much this will slow down his progress or not. I think that's why he was quite keen to leave in the summer and go to Chelsea because he knew he would have played more there because there's obviously not a Watkins there compared to staying at Villa. But he's got plenty of time, but he's so, so talented. By the way, I'm going to throw in a brief digression here since you mentioned him coming back late, uh, like a lot of South American players. Um, Cuti Romero liked a tweet uh, yeah, I saw that. Where, which said that Tottenham... From an Argentine journalist, yeah. yeah. Didn't arrange sort of private air travel for their national team players coming back from, from South America, which yeah. some clubs do. Um, I don't have a breakdown of who gets to fly in the private jet and who has to fly commercial. And look, obviously... It depends on many factors. It depends when the next direct commercial flight is and stuff. Obviously, we need to get to London. London has a lot of flights to South America and so on. So there's a lot of factors yeah. that go into it. But uh, we've seen in the past where teams that maybe have multiple South Americans, they say, hey, let's put our money together and pay yeah, for share, private air course. travel, right? Yeah, we've seen it many, many times. But I don't, I think it's, you don't have any information on this. I'd love, I, I, think, I think somebody should write about this. Figure out in which who does this and why. Like I'm assuming who, who shares flights. Yeah, I mean. like but you don't I, even have to. I think it's it's a no-brainer for a club like Spurs or any club, especially before a big game at the weekend, to try to bring suddenly your most some of your most important right. players as soon as possible no, back but, to the training ground. Because you're in London. I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know if there's other Argentine or because Argentina play Colombia, right? Yeah. So I don't know what other Argentine or Colombian nationals are in London. Off the top of my head, uh, I'm sure there must be some. But even John Duran, right? He, he could have chipped in on the flight yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's got to be ways. Oh, you mean the players? No, no, not the players. Oh, the clubs. The clubs. Yeah, so sorry, Villa, and Ar sorry. Villa and Arsenal say, "Hey, yeah, it's in our interest to these meant, guys back." Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. sorry, Villa and, and Spurs in this yeah, case, yeah. right? Um, I would assume that, like, if you're uh, if you're in, if you're in, in in a smaller town, which which or you know doesn't have the direct flights as well, like if you're in Manchester, it makes a big difference having him fly direct back directly back to Manchester. I'm yeah, sure yeah. United and City and maybe Liverpool and Everton too, they could all chip in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's I'd love to know if they quite, do that. It's quite common. Yeah, it is quite common. But I know it. Even same we for should have African actual players. facts about this. I think that would be relevant. Rather than us speculate. Yeah, but even, if you, don't don't share, even See, if you can't share, those this is part of your budget as a club to already plan for those international players who will come back straight with a private jet that the clubs pay. And it's expensive. It's £5,000 an hour or something like that. So for a flight of 10 hours, it costs you a lot of money to bring back Kuti Romero or whoever right. you're playing. But that's why if you're bringing back John Duran as well, it's costing you half as much. Yeah, and it's in the sure. interest, not just of the two clubs, it's in the interest of the Premier League to have their best players back. Yeah, yeah. But the clubs do that. It's common. But even if you could not find an agreement with Aston Villa, however, clubs like Spurs, every club really should do that for their players and not tell them to take the next uh, British Airways flight from Buenos Aires to London and come back on their own. Like it's just that should not be happening. Unless it's Anthony, of course, in which case you can take a little more time. He doesn't even travel anymore because he doesn't even call up. So, UFR have written to the UK government uh, saying that if the proposed regulator is seen to be interfering with football, there could be no Euros and no Champions League for English, Welsh and Scottish clubs. Yeah, that's, that sounds scary. And can you explain it a little bit more? Yeah, it sounds scary. You don't need to worry about it. It's it like never happen. There's no beast under your bed. It's not in your closet, not in your head. Uh, look, as we've talked about this before, both... 
the government, so in this country, labor and the opposition, conservatives, there's a bunch of them that agree that football is so important in this, in this country that it needs a regulator in the same way that we regulate the water company or yeah. the uh, electrical company or private schools or whatever. There has to be some independent entity that says, okay, these are the rules. You can't go beyond that, right? Football Association, you have some rules. Premier League, you govern other rules. You guys, we can't leave it all up to you. And this could mean ticket prices. It could mean travel. It could be whatever else. Um, but you need to pass a law to do this. Yeah. I think it would be kind of unprecedented. I don't think other countries I don't think have so this. Either. Of course, in other countries, you often have a stronger FA that doesn't get bullied and pushed around <laughs> by the clubs. Yeah. But that's another issue. Um, one of the clauses in here in, in sort of that, that's been talked about and it's been in some of the draft bills that were never actually voted on is saying that the leagues have to kind of follow the government foreign policy. So, for example, if, if Vladimir Putin right now, obviously with the issues and the sanctions against Russia, if he wanted to go and buy Sheffield United, let's say, the regulator could say no because you're not a welcome person here, yeah. right? Um, UEFA, on principle, like FIFA, say governments cannot interfere with the FA. Right? So unless you're actually breaking the law of the land, again, the Putin case might be not a great example because he might be breaking the law of the land because he's probably sanctioned, but I, whatever, somebody yeah, else, yeah, right? Somebody so, else, some, yeah. some dude from North Korea nobody's ever heard of, yeah. right? Um, so essentially they're saying, guys, don't put this in there because you will have a problem. Government, we don't want to cre open a door for government dictating to sport how sport should be run. Actually, fair enough. Unless you pass an actual law, right? Yeah, yeah. That, which is obviously a different issue. Um, so I think this is just, I, honestly, I think the happiest people to receive this letter saying like, oh, you're going to be kicked out are the Premier League clubs who obviously want as don't little want regulation as possible. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is way back on Friday, but Borussia Dortmund beat Heidenheim at home 4-2. Jules, is Nuri Shaheen showing signs of improvement? I, th I thought that was the first game, Gab, where I really uh, enjoyed watching them and I thought they looked good. To be fair, uh, Cameron De Yemi scored two goals and Eidenheim is a good team, as we've said before, and they gave them a good game. They were, apparently, they were top of the league at the time. Yeah, they, they, were, yeah. they gave them a really good game, created chances on their own. So I think this Nuri Sahin new Borussia Dortmund will be quite open, which makes for a lot of fun to watch. I really enjoyed this game, to be fair. I don't know how far you can go by not being a bit stronger defensively, but that also can improve further down the line in the season. So let's see, but I, I, there's something I liked about Nuri Sain a lot, and I can't tell you why it is. Maybe the, he was a beautiful player to watch, and now I want yeah. him to do well as a manager, but I don't know, because I don't really care about him, or I'm not a Dortmund I liked fan. him more as a player. Do you see what I mean? I think there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, yeah, I think sure. Adeyemi feels like he still plays by himself uh, a lot of the time. Nice to see Mane on the score sheet. Yeah, I have no idea right, how big yeah. a role he's going to play this season. No, that's true. We got to see Girassi, which is yeah. kind of a novelty. Um, we'll see how it works out. But it was only 4-2 because they, 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 they got that goal late on. Otherwise, you know, it could have been definitely yeah, squeaky bomb ending. Yeah, both sides, for sure. Yeah. Conor Gallagher and Julian Alvarez both score their first Atletico goal in their 3-0 win over Valencia on Sunday night. Gab, who impressed you the most? I mean, Conor Gallagher. Alvarez do, do, came on late. Do, so. do, do, do. It's Conor Gallagher. Of course, yes. And they could have scored more. Sorloff yeah. had a chance early on. Uh, Griezmann. Was so good. So, Griezmann so very good. sneaky there. I, I, okay, so I need to good. know. Griezmann's reaction. Griezmann must be the best video game player in the world. His reaction time for his goal. And please go back and watch this, right? So there, 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 there's a cross that, that comes in. I forget who it was. Maybe Lino goes up for the header and kind of he's all uncoordinated and twisting because the ball is swimming. It is is uh, the, the, sorry, the ball is spinning. The ball comes off him at a weird angle. Griezmann reacts faster than everybody. I don't know how he does it. I think it's because he's always in movement. He's always running. He's uh, always been one of his strengths. And I think because he's always running, he's always in movement, always in motion. That's what gives him that extra second or second ahead of everybody else. But the question is not about him. And by the way, he does look cooler now that he's grown his hair out a little bit. Uh, he's he got, was the he best player in that, he's, that game. Conor Gallagher got the official La Liga for EA Sports. Yeah, MVP. I saw that too. Yeah. So, um, we said it before, he's a really good fit for this team. Because when they line up, you've got, in him and Depaul, you've got two guys who never stop running and who wreak havoc. You have Marcos Llorente who never stops running. Yeah. And that's okay. They can wreak havoc because behind them you have Coquet playmaking. And he doesn't need to worry about that size. And you don't need to worry about 
being a number 10 where you necessarily have to deliver the perfect assist or whatever. Um, I think it's a great fit. I think the fans already love him. And we can debate the fee and whatever. But to me, the broader lesson is fit. He did not fit at Chelsea yeah. based on what the club wanted, both his whole contractual situation, but also I think tactically he would have been hard to fit into this team. Yeah, yeah definitely. There's no point hiring Maresca to give him a player which doesn't necessarily, who doesn't necessarily fit what he yeah. wants to do. Yeah, that's true. Marseille beat Nice 2-0 to stay second in Ligue 1, but Jules, all the buzz is about oh. whether Adrian Rabio has finally found a home. He has, and that new home will be Marseille, Gab. Uh, which is a bit strange, not strange, because, you know, he has a good feeling about the Zerbi, they spoke a lot. Can you not have a good feeling about the Zerbi with his little goatee yeah, no, true. and his twinkly eyes? But what's strange is that uh, all summer long, Rabio wanted a team that played in the Champions League. Uh, he wanted the top top English club, for example. That was his, his, his preference. And <clears throat> the discussions with United didn't go far enough for him to join. So now to go to Marseille, where they don't play in Europe at all this, this season, for example, could maybe look a bit strange. But I think, as we said the other day, when we talked about our f 11, like free agents starting 11, you drop your kind of demands in a way uh, because... It's, it's September now, mid-September, and he had no club. So I think you look maybe a bit below the standard that you wanted initially. <clears throat> and that's why Marseille are offering him a really good contract, the kind of money that Aubameyang was on last season, plus massive bonuses if they finish in Champions League positions, for example, for next season, all that kind of stuff, a good signing on fee too. And for him, <clears throat> he's also taking a pay cut compared to what he was earning at Juventus and accepting the fact that he won't play in Europe this season. I'm curious about this United thing. Now, obviously, if you're United, you just want to add bodies mm -hmm. and talent because in the middle of the park, obviously, you you are limited. With, you know, Mount's injury, Casemiro getting older, get to play Ericsson at the weekend. But equally, where would he have fit in the system? Assuming United play some variants on the 4-2-3-1, if you've got Bruno in the hole, would you have played him as one of the two? Yeah, I think with Mano, yeah. Mano, Rabio. Yeah. I don't know. I, I I like him in a three where he's on the yeah, left hand side of the three, but he would play in the two at Marseille. All right. Yeah. He let's plays see. in the two for France. Let's see how the Zerbi does that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I th but I think the Zerbi was really, really keen to have him and the plan is to play him in the Hoiberg. So All right. know, we see. We we'll see. Sevilla get the first win of the season beating Getafe one 0 But Gab, how about the goal scorer? Jesus Navas, <clears throat> 39 years young. He's one of La Liga's uh, all-time yeah, oldest. oldest. Yeah. Maybe in the oldest. Uh, he could have had two goals in this game. Huge win uh, for Sevilla. Obviously, I said, not getting off to the greatest of starts. It's just so nice to see this. The guy wins the Euros in the uh, summer. Uh, now he scores a goal, age 39. Legend. legend. Um, you know, he's got all those, people forget, but he's got all those trophies from years ago when he played for Manchester <laughs> City. Uh, and that really feels like an age ago. Uh, incredible. What time is it? Uh, it's Texter hey! time! Jules, Leon get a draw away to Lons, which means that for the third time in four games, they failed to score. And Marseille are up next. Should he substitute himself up front? Um, no, yeah. no, no, because they were good, actually, Gab. They were really good. Uh, they were really good. They had chances like Cazette, Gift Orban, who this time um, didn't score, uh, unlike the last game against Strasbourg. So they were good, and to be fair, lost. it was a nice game. It was a nice nil-nil draw, really open and really nice to watch as well. And then, as you said, it's the Olympico on Sunday, and that will be massive because the Zerbi and Marseille, and as we've been saying, have done really, really well. And this is now better from Lyon. And Texter said, I want top four finish. So this is the objective for... This is his, this is his baseline, top yeah. four. Yeah, so stone-wise, the pressure is there. How many pressure is there... Like it's even like the know, voters are bringing more Marseille. I'm assuming Paris Saint Germain, Monaco, Marseille, Lyon on paper, right? Am they I should, forgetting? Yeah. Am I forgetting somebody, right? No, that's, so that's Lille or our friend Joseph and Lens or yeah. or Ren with the kids. Yeah. Somebody's got to do something in exploit. Yeah. To yeah, yeah, yeah. bust into it, right? But how many times have we said like, okay, you have the four big favorite, right? and then it doesn't just happen like yeah, but it kind of feels like oh, let me pay you a bonus for you putting on your trousers in the morning. I, <laughs> you know what I mean, like. Or whatever. Yeah, but I guess when you start so bad as badly as they did, maybe that fourth place doesn't look Yeah, but look now like he fired the sporting director, so everything's going to be That's fine. True. Let's see, let's see. But well done 
uh, John Texter for not losing this weekend, I guess. You know, that's what we can give it to him. Ben Chilwell, remember him? Has been Huda. included in Chelsea's 25 man Premier League squads. Are you surprised or is it just about homegrown talent and English players in your squads? Um, I'm not surprised. No, it's about freaking common sense, right? I mean, they have enough association trained players anyway in right. their squad that they want to put them in. It's, yeah, you can go and play the bully boy. Like, you're not going to play. You're not in my plans. But ultimately, I mean, you'd have to be a complete moron, which Chelsea are not, despite what some people think, yeah. to go and say, oh, no, 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 uh, Chile, no, no, we don't want you, right? You got a slot for him, you put him in there. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll need him at some point. Maybe yeah. Kukureya and Colwell, everybody else who can play left back gets hurt. Maybe, maybe he trains so hard that, that uh, Maresca says, you know what, I can make it work with you. You know, maybe you shop window him. Um, so to me, it's, 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 it's just common sense. It would, be, would have been mad otherwise since they have the slot for him. Newcastle come from behind to be Wolves 2-1, and they're joint second in the yes. table. Hey, all this hype for Arteta, <clears throat> what about some love for Eddie Howe? Yeah, exactly. He had a few things to get off his chest following that Paul Mitchell interview, where, if you remember, Paul Mitchell came in, he's a sporting director, he said their previous windows were not fit for purpose. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Eddie was not happy, as you would expect. Try to defend his player, especially because even if you're a player and you hear your new sporting director saying, well, we signed you, but really that was a mistake. Uh, it's not nice to hear, I think. <laughs> so Eddie coming out saying that he was very proud of all the players that they signed in previous transfer windows, blah, blah, blah. I think for me, the most striking in what Eddie Howard to say, Gab, was the fact that he said that he hadn't spoken to Paul Mitchell since the interview, which was nine days ago. So I suspect that Paul Mitchell is a lot at the training ground where Eddie Howe is, which means that they must be not far from right. each other every day and they don't speak. So this, you're absolutely right. This is really the appalling part. Look, the other thing is obviously Eddie Howe is going to defend his signings because he had a big say in them. Um, yeah. And that's fine. When he says, oh, it's very easy after the fact to criticize. Anyway, guess what, Eddie? This is real life. And Eddie knows this, right? After the fact, you look at the results and they of make course. right decisions, bad decisions. This is just how, this is called accountability. Mm -hmm. And Eddie Howe understands this. Um, I think it's fun to hear Paul Mitchell say that and speak openly. I, I think he probably did cross a line unless... He said, hey, Eddie, I'm going to say this, and we'll throw Dan Ashworth under the bus, and just so you know, this is how I feel about it. Are you okay with it? Whatever. This, is, yeah. this would have been the context, right, if he had told him this. If this came into surprise to Eddie Howe, that's not cool. But the fact that they haven't spoken in that's nine weird. days since then. Uh, that is uh, weird. When we say how strong the relationship between a sporting director and coach should be, we right. said it all the time. So this is not looking good at all. The chief executive of... Newcastle, if I'm not mistaken, is that guy Darren Eels, who was in the U.S. Yeah. Everybody says so smart. Um, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he hasn't tried this already. I expect you take the two of them, you grab them by the ear, you pull them along like little children, you put them in a room, and you say, "Okay, you guys have to work together. You will talk. You've had an, you had an international break. Eddie doesn't mean you go off golfing. Paul, it doesn't mean you go and you nerd out with your videos. Yeah, you sit together." And we draw a line under this incident, and you work together if there is a problem there. And we quash this immediately. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know. I mean, I again, I hope he knew that they were going to come out and say these things, Darren Eels. Otherwise, he's thinking, like, what am I, dealing with children here? <laughs> UFR have warned the Italian FA that they need at least five stadiums that comply with requirements so he, for Italy to be able to co-host Euro 2032 with Turkey. And right now, they only have one. Yes, and that stadium is the Juventus game. This is the age-old issue. Yeah. Is there's a level of bureaucracy in many cities. Uh, in other cities like Rome, whenever you dig a hole, you find some sort of Etruscan artifact or Roman artifact, and then everything gets shut down. Um, like they know this. Again, it's another one of those situations where they welcome the letter from UEFA. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it was Michele Uva, one of the Italian guys at UEFA, who sent the letter because now they can go to the government and say, hey, government, hello, uh, can you help us out here? Can you just get rid of all this red tape? We'll, we'll pay for the stadium. We want to build a stadium. Fiorentina has actually sued their local government in Florence because they want to build a stadium. Yeah. But they need to get around all this red, red, what they consider to be all this red tape. So I'm not overly concerned they don't need to it's rebuild the stadiums. Well. Yeah. It's, it's eight years away. And look, worst comes to worst, we'll just all 
go to Turkey yeah. and they can host a whole tournament. Great food, great weather, lovely people. I got yeah. no issue with that. No, me neither. Great barbers. Yeah. Leipzig follow up their victory over Bayer Leverkusen with a scoreless draw at home against Union Berlin, which I guess makes producer Freddie happy. He was happy. Um, are Leipzig legit contenders or still the Marco Rose roller coaster? Yeah, I think it's still the roller coaster, Gab. You're right. Uh, Luis Openda, who we praised and rightly so after the Bayer Leverkusen game and his performance, the goals that he scored, missed the penalty. It's not the first time. And overall, they had chances. They should have won this game. Yeah, probably against a team that defended for their lives. But you, you are contenders if you win those kind of games where you don't play great, maybe, but you still have enough to go and win. And in the end, it's two points drop. I know it's only early in the season. So it's not all too much of a disaster. But I just expected them to win. And the way they played, they should have won the game. But again, a bit like what we saw a lot last season too. They just don't win those games. They just don't find that... An extra efficiency I, or something special from someone to go and win it, even you know, even when they deserve it. On paper, Openda, Sesco, Xavi, Simons. If you were buying futures, right, and put some money down about like three years from now, which yeah. trio is going to be the best? You would probably put them in the yeah, top yeah. ten, if not top five in Europe. You're right, and they're already productive now. Yeah. So I think this is an indictment on Marco Rosa. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And this is not, nothing new again. We've said that many times before. Mauricio Pochettino will be earning around $6 million a year as coach of the US men's national team. But Gab, some hedge fund billionaire will be paying a big chunk of that. Yeah, it's a guy named Ken Griffin, who um, uh, he, his fund is called Citadel. Um, he's decided to kick in money. It's it's a tax deductible donation. Okay, so uh, where he's interested in it, yeah. I think, you know, it, it it helps in that sense. We've seen sponsors pay for um, pay for coaches' salaries. Um, this is a little bit odd, right? So he's donated to football causes before, he's built pitches and stuff. I mean, again, the guy's a multi billionaire. He's donated to a bunch of different things. I like six Six million, or it's actually really a portion of six million. It's probably a drop of the bucket yeah, to yeah. him, right? Equally, I wonder, and presumably it's his own money. It's not Citadel's, right? Yeah, it's not yeah. Citadel's investors. But still, when you do this, you normally do it because you get some benefit. And maybe he's the biggest Pochettino fan in the world. Yeah. In which case, he could just give the money to Pochettino, I guess. <laughs> and he wants to help the U.S. men's national team. Uh, yeah, I just, I think people will ask questions about potential conflicts of interest. So you want to make sure that this is all legally very, very clear. When a sponsor does it, obviously the U.S. does well. So like maybe he does it with him. Maybe he's bought a bunch of football assets in the U.S. and he figures, okay, if we get Pochettino, I can help with that. The U.S. national team does well. So value of my assets increase. Um, yeah. it's, it's certainly an unusual one, put it that way. Victor Gyokares has scored in his last seven games this season, including internationals. He has eight goals in five games after Sporting's 3-0 victory, uh, Aruka. Uh, he's still not the best Scandi big Scandinavian nope, center forward out there. There's, there's another dude. Yeah. Um, but are you surprised he's still at Sporting? Are you surprised over yeah, the summer? Yeah, a bit. I, I think his release clause is really high, something like 80 million uh, euros. So it's you don't need to pay the release clause. No, like, no, no, no. But well, Siemens was 120 million. True, and, but sometimes you have to pay it. Sometimes you can negotiate lower. Sometimes you can't. Maybe that's why. Maybe people want to wait a little bit more and see more in the Champions League, like we will see this season. They start against Lille, for example, uh, this week. Maybe that's why. But I just think he's that good on the back of a very good season last year too to have started in this form incredible and goals and assists it's, it's his all-round game that is he's not just the finisher you know like a Haaland is for example it's everything that he does he's so strong he's so good the, I, I would if I would bet I bet that this is his last season maybe the last six months and then January could even be a move for him so obviously we've seen this summer by the way trend-wise big prolific yeah. centre forwards struggling to yeah. get much love, whether you can put Ivan Tony in that uh, bucket uh, as well. There is a whole tradition in Portugal of often foreign, big, strong, target men, center forward types just absolutely dominating yeah, yeah. the league. This goes all the way back to Mario Jardel, yeah, right? of course. Um, and I think maybe there's some skepticism about that. Yeah. 
could that work out differently? But you're right. The Champions League this year, I think, will be good. Yeah, it'll be interesting form. to see him there. Giorgio Chiellini is back at Juventus, Gav. Does that make sense? Are you happy? Yeah, exactly. Like we said, it depends what job yep. you give him, right? But he spent time in the States. He's improved his English. He's very visible among among the ex-players that, that Juve have. You know, the of the three that they mentioned, right? Del Piero, I think, was ever only going to consider like a serious job with serial res- responsibility. Claudio Marchisio, who I think they could do more with for whatever reason. Maybe he'll be involved in a different way. I don't know. Yeah. But Chiellini, he's going to be in charge of their football institutional relations, which means he'll be, kind of be the Emilio Butragueño okay. of, uh, of Juventus. You know, he's going to go to the meetings rep- or, the, or the Pupi Sanetti of Inter. Yeah. He's going to represent the club in those contexts. He's going to report back to the top. If he enjoys that, that's fine. Some people love that job, just talking to a lot of people and traveling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Others want sort of substantial influence. We'll see if he gets bored with it. We'll see if he's maybe grooming himself for, for, for a bigger role. I don't know. It's a new experience for him. Hmm. We were wondering about the future of David Dacher for Fana, Jules. <laughs> um, it was keeping me up at night because yeah, he wasn't on the Chelsea website. I know, you were really, really stressed about that. But now I find out he's joining Gostepe in oh. Turkey on loan. Another wage off the books for Chelsea? Yeah, I guess so. Not that he was making a lot of money, but yeah, yeah, I think that's good. And I don't think he had a number. I don't think he had a, <laughs> a, locker, a locker in the dressing a parking room. Pass. He was not even on the Chelsea website, as you reminded <laughs> us on Monday, on Thursday. So good. I hope he plays. You don't. You just want people to play and enjoy their football and everything. So I hope he plays. Goes to Turkey. He has worked for people to get good form in Turkey and then come back to a better league, for example. So. Let's see. And for Chelsea, it's one problem, I guess, less to sort out with the, the big squad that they have already. And staying in Turkey, Gab, Victor Ozyman made his debut for Galatasaray in their 5-0 win over Rize Spore at the weekend. How did it go for him? He didn't score. No. But he was phenomenal. He the fans loved him. He provided assists. He worked hard. And you know what this tells me, Jules? Tell me. The best is yet to come. Get excited. The guy hasn't played club football in forever. Comes back in. He's hungry. He's got his mask ready if needed. Um, it's good times. Good times for Victor O. 